Hi, and welcome to the Unreal Engine News and Community Spotlight. At NAB 2018 in Las Vegas, AMD partnered with AR Wall to showcase a new use for real-time rendering in virtual production, an augmented reality wall that responds to changes in camera perspective, thus eliminating the need for compositing green screen footage with rendered CG in post-production. With the AR Wall effects system, real-time images are displayed on a screen large enough to serve as a scene's backdrop and the images update in real time in response to the camera's movement. When live actors stand in front of the wall, the result is an instantly composited shot, a real-time 3D virtual set extension. To generate real-time updates to the background, ARFX uses Unreal Engine in conjunction with a set of trackers attached to the camera. The system can also employ AMD's advanced media framework and IRT sensor to provide lighting information to the engine. A ZCam 360 camera collects the lighting info, which then the engine uses to light virtual set extension, the, the virtual <laughs> set extension to match the practical set and respond to any lighting changes in real time. Watch the video on our site for more information on how it's done. Over 2,000 members of the gaming community gathered on the English South Coast last week as Develop Brighton, uh, Europe's largest game developer conference, hosted another successful event. Epic Games was pleased to provide Unreal Engine developers an opportunity to be showcased in the Unreal Networking Lounge, which offered 10 studios the opportunity to showcase their upcoming games to potential partners, investors, and players. The various playable games at the Expo demonstrated the scope of what developers can create with Unreal, whether exploring the gorgeous vistas of nodding head games Raji and Ancient Epic, participating in fast-paced games of Atomic Atomicom's Elevate Combat League, or trying to bring football home in Cherry Pop Games' Football Nation VR tournament, there is a wide variety of content for everyone to enjoy. I encourage you to take a look through all of the fantastic titles on display in the Unreal Networking Lounge. In under a month, we're kicking off our summer UE4 Jam. Each quarter, our UE4 Jams are held to provide developers the opportunity to own their development shops, try out a new feature, or put a new crew through the paces. The Summer UE Jam theme will be announced at the end of the Unreal Engine live stream on Thursday, August 16th, concluding around 3 p.m. Jammers will, jammers will then have five days to complete their games, which will then be reviewed by our judges. Our sponsors are providing some excellent prizes for our winning teams, including an Intel Optane SSD and a Houdini Indie license from SideFX, among many other prizes. Additionally, all summer UE4 Jam finalists will be entered into a raffle for a custom Unreal Engine branded laptop from Falcon Northwest. You can sign up for the Jam now and access some resources to prepare, prepare for the Jam, such as version control from Assembla or a Houdini trial from SideFX on our itch.io page. Unreal Engine has seen a wave of adoption in live broadcast and virtual production workflows over the past year, and we're excited to offer support for HD SDI input and output for the first time in Unreal Engine in the Unreal Engine 420 release. Whether working in live production or live broadcast, virtual production, or even esports, you now have the support for HD SDI video and audio input output with Aja Video Systems, Corvid 44, and Kona 4 cards. This includes full support key and fill video inputs, outputs, LTC, VITC timecodes, and fully gen-lockable video workflows, enabling integration of AR and graphics in live broadcast, broadcast transmissions. Check out AJA's site announcement linked below for more details. Unreal Engine 420 release introduced our new proxy LOD, a tool essential for shipping Fortnite on mobile. The proxy LOD tool provides massive performance advantages by reducing rendering costs due to poly count, draw calls, and material complexity. Proxy LOD also delivers significant games when, gains when optimizing content for mobile and console platforms. Read the full article by Sam Deiter for an in-depth look at the Proxy LOD tool in which he explores how the technical artists and engineers at Epic developed this ingenious solution that ensures the construction and destruction elements found in Fortnite Battle Royale played and looked the same no matter what platform it was being played on. So on to our weekly karma earners. These folks are helping out their fellow developers on Answer Hub, answering questions, giving 
workflow or workarounds. So a huge thanks to Shadow River, Placenta 8, Nebula Games Inc., Jackpot Robot, Dijo, Redbox, Art of Azda, NG256, Mighty Enigma, Brian Johnstone, and Mopard. Thank you so much, you all. Our first community spotlight is a piece called Fears Be Gone. It's a 3D puzzle platformer game where the player takes the role of this adorable little teddy bear named Mr. Stuggles, who's inside the dream of a seven-year-old kid named Joe. The main goal of Mr. Snuggles is to defeat the shadow monsters who are haunting Joe's dreams, so it doesn't turn into a nightmare. However, the shadow monsters can only be defeated using shadow weapons. Mr. Snuggles must use switches on the floor to align lights in a way that they cast the shadow of the weapons to attack the enemies. Our second community spotlight is a piece called Spaceborn. It's a space simulation, arcade, open world RPG game with a universe containing over 100 solar systems, more than 400 planets, and 37 landable space stations. You play through the game, modifying your ships and weapons, while in the meantime you can mine asteroids, salvage wrecks, bounty hut, discover black holes, um, and any number of things. In addition to the main storyline, players may accept side missions and help races that are at war with each other, and the whole experience is designed uh, so Spaceborn is supposed to give players the ultimate freedom in their experience. Our third and final spotlight is called The Unexpected Quest, working title. It's a casual strategy game with time management elements. It's a story about men and women, dwarves and elves, orcs and undeads, being forced in the face of great evil into heroism they never knew they were capable of. The Ryonix team currently has one level available, which you can download and demo on their itch page. It just looks like a great, enjoyable game. Lots of work has clearly gone into it. I can't see, can't wait to see the rest of the levels. Thanks for joining us for our news and community spotlight. Hi, and welcome to our Unreal Engine uh, live stream. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say <laughs> music community spotlight. Oh, okay. Yeah, and and the community stream. <laughs> right. Um, Both. <laughs> I'm your host, Amanda Bott. Uh, with me, we have Wyeth and Sean. Wyeth is a, one of our lead technical artists, and uh, Sean is our senior, one of our senior engineers. So thank you both for joining us. It's our pleasure. Yeah. And then uh, Tim has me? also joined yeah, us. I'm here too. Fellow community <laughs> manager. Hey. So. hey, guys. Thank you all for joining the stream. For the uh, live community. <laughs> 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 it's been uh, a long day. It is. Um, would you like to give a brief overview of what we're talking about today? Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to take that. So... Uh, the context is we're talking about uh, kind of our, our next-gen VFX simulation. Um, the, the tool is called Niagara. It's our forward-thinking kind of programmable replacement for Cascade. So people who have done VFX in Unreal in the past, you might have used Cascade to do that. It's a modular tool that snaps particle behaviors together. Mm -hmm. um, and we're kind of reimagining, okay, what does a next-gen version of that idea look like? Um, and that's this new tool uh, called Niagara. Um, the reason we're doing the stream today is because uh, with the release of Unreal 420, mm -hmm. Niagara is now officially a big boy. So it's early access. <laughs> that does not mean go ahead and ship things on me yet. It just means I'm mature enough that we need to get it in the hands of the community, let them start banging on mm -hmm. it, let them start finding all the things that we just never could have imagined to do. The various use cases. Please go break it. <laughs> it's, we're desperate for it to be broken yeah. as many ways as possible because that's how these things stabilize uh -huh. themselves. Right. But, but the tool is, is in early access now. Um, and so early access Yay. just means you got it, play with it. We're going to keep making it better. We're going to keep making it more performant. In the meantime, we need as much feedback from the community as possible. Um, so as far as the, the tool itself mm -hmm. and at GDC this year, yeah. um, we gave an hour-long presentation on the architecture of this thing. So we did a, actually a pretty deep dive. We went into the fundamental why do we need a new system, what, here are all the bones and the pieces, and what are kind of the tentpole features that we've built this thing on. Um, that was G GDC 2018, and we recorded that whole session, mm -hmm. and it's up on the YouTubes and all the other video sites and stuff like that. So if you're really interested in VFX, but you haven't been exposed to our new system, my recommendation was watch this, and let's see, sh you know, we're, we're going to guide you in a little bit, mm -hmm. but also you should definitely go and watch that hour-long presentation, because it goes a lot of 
deep, you know, much more in depth into the parts of the system that are a little bit more philosophical. Mm -hmm. Why did we do this? Right. Um, we probably wouldn't cover as much of that today. I mm -hmm. want right. to actually have Sean and I get into the m more nitty gritty stuff and just show, you, hey, do you want to make particles fly around? Here's a good way to do it. Right. Um, but anyway, that between this and that, hopefully, if you're just coming new to it, like, ooh, I want to, I want to do the new fancy stuff mm -hmm. in Unreal. Y I think you would be pretty well served to kind of. To, to do both things. So. Enjoy both, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. The, best, the best thing about doing this is that we're live, right? And so anybody that can join us, feel free to ask questions as we go along. Please. That's mm -hmm. really like the exciting part for us is that give and take and being able to answer. If we breeze past something that you're like, wait, 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 hold on a second, what was that? Feel yep. free to throw it out in the stream, and we'll try and respond as best we can. Yeah, so instead of doing, normally we save our Q&A for the end, but we're kind of going to do that throughout the whole stream today. So if there's something they're working on or in the mm -hmm. middle of, and you have questions about that, we're going to try and quickly move those into the discussion we're having. Um, yeah, and then there's also Frank is in the Twitch chat, I believe, and is also going to be in there diving in, helping answer questions. So He's another one of the main architects of the tool, so mm -hmm. he's... Well equipped, as well equipped any of us to, <laughs> to answer anything. So, all right. So, um, so how do you want to start? I was thinking maybe we just go literally one by one down the hallway. Yeah, and then I think that's kind of like to start. All right, from the very simplest thing, here's why we built it the way we did in in our tool versus mm -hmm. maybe how we would have built it in Cascade, and then maybe that'll lead us in some philosophical yeah. conversations. And I'm sure we'll get off into the weeds immediately about <laughs> some <laughs> minutia, yeah. but um, you know that's the fun of it. So what Wyeth has up here. Um, is the 420 content examples. Um, so content examples is a great set of demonstrations, hallways, sort of showing off different pieces of technology on Unreal. Wyeth created with um, some other artists the Niagara hallway that has just sort of step-by-step -step showing you individual things, um, interesting snippets, interesting um, pieces of technology that you might not otherwise realize exist. So that we're gonna kind of walk through each one of these and dig in with a little bit more detail so that you can then go back and explore on your own and feel a little bit more prepared and a little bit more oriented to the tool and its capabilities. Yeah, and, and so each of these examples, they, they don't necessarily march forward in complexity necessarily, although the first ones are simple. It's very much feature-based. And so as you open each of these guys uh, to, to check them out for yourselves, oh, and by the way, I should mention Learn tab in the launcher. Right. So That's you're you at the marketplace, you go to the Learn tab, you, you know, you're not going to the standard uh, stuff. You go over to Learn, and then there's a content example project in there. So that's what you want if you're looking to, uh, to access this stuff. Um, and that's the hallway that they can download. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. And, and then when you open that project, there's a UMAP, Niagara UMAP in there, and that's this guy. And there's links to the documentation in here as well. You can click the little green floaty guy, and that'll jump you to our, our first pass docs about the tool. Um, I should say the docs are really early as yeah. well. There is tons of tribal knowledge. There is tons of just stuff that we haven't covered in the documentation. We will touch a little bit more on some of that with you guys now, um, but we have tons of documentation work today to, to do. So don't be scared by what's there. There's more coming. And you know the learning curve right now is, is going to be steep just because we don't have a lot of that documentation in place. Um, I don't, don't want that to scare you off. Um, We've already been working with the community, and there's been several people that have been able to dig in and get really deep really fast. It's just, you know, just expect there to be crashes here and there. Expect there to be things you don't quite understand. Um, and we're going to keep, you know, plugging away and improving these sorts of things. But we need your input and your feedback in order to make this tool the best it can possibly be. Um, so while Wyeth is getting this brought up, one thing that I want to bring out, so the, the content examples already has this enabled, but Niagara is built as a standalone plugin to Unreal Engine. So that means that you will need to go into the plugin manager in your own project if you want to experiment with it uh, and enable the Niagara plugin. Uh, there's also uh, a couple other plugins that, can, that you can optionally include with it. Uh, there's a Houdini integration, and then there's sort of just a fun set of extras that has functions and things that um, aren't really critical for production use, but are just cool things that we built along the way that we found you know, interesting. I believe this, that the content examples has extras in it, as yeah. well as the primary Niagara plugin. It does, yeah. And extras, people were really curious about extras. Extras is a second plugin that just has fun stuff in it. Yeah. Basically, it was stuff that we didn't think deserved to be an official supported aspect of the tool, 
but was an interesting experiment, was a specialist feature rather than a generalized feature. Um, basically just stuff that we think the community would be interested in, but isn't necessarily official. Uh, so you turn that on if you just want m more playground, basically. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, this w is the first guy in the hallway. This is the this basically just our simple sprite emitter. Um, basically what it's doing is it's just spawning particles at a constant spawn rate, five per second. And the first thing I want to talk about is these concept of the attributes of the particle. So the, the biggest mental shift you have to make when moving from Cascade to Niagara <laughs> is you really have to be ex explicit about thinking about particles as attributes. They're just a bucket of attributes. And these attributes, they're, they're part of what we call our payload, but they have a direct influence on the simulation. Where am I being rendered? How fast am I moving? What color am I? So on. Each of these things, these attributes, the lifetime, sprite size, or whatever, can be written to directly. So what I'm doing here is, is instead of having a module that is doing a bunch of lifetime management or whatever, or, or doing more complex behavior, if I just say, I want my lifetime of my particle to be four seconds, I can just directly set that particle lifetime, that attribute, to four seconds. And so we have these, these nodes here called set variable nodes. These are ways to just directly say, OK, I know about an attribute of a particle. I, I know I want to directly set how big am I? You know, which direction am I facing? What is my rotation? And I can just directly set that attribute. Um, so that's one of the important differences here. In Cascade, you would have put in a lifetime module. And that module will, would have had a bunch of default behaviors in it uh, that you could opt in and out of. We're taking an approach here, which is the most lightweight one possible, which is just directly talk to the variable. Um, if you want to do something more complex, we write a module to do that. But I just wanted to, to kind of make that understood, is that you really have to switch your mental model to think about what are my particle attributes, and how do I want to write to them? So we did get a question uh, yep. about Niagara. Specifically, in, uh, the question is, uh, seamless loops are hard to control in Niagara right now because particles are killed when their sequencer track ends, is this something that's going to be improved within with the future of Niagara? Yeah, uh, the, 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 the track, the timeline, basically has to do some artificial kind of re-simming, and the, you, you, you generally see some like popping and stuff as it transitions in between. Uh, and when it reaches the total end, it basically has to re-sim back to zero and then continue again. If you drop this emitter in the world, you'll notice, and you'll notice it, it's happening here because I'm previewing it in the timeline, if I drop this guy in the world, you don't notice those hitches and pops and resets because we have an ever advancing age of the system. It's not beholden to the, um, the yep. kind of artificial environment that the timeline is introducing as a, as a preview mechanism. So at some point, we will make the timeline have a seamless preview. But for now, you can trust that as long as you place it in the world and it's doing what you expect, that's exactly the result you're going to get. So just don't base your visuals on You should be preview. placing your emitters in the world if you really want to have a 100% authoritative look at what they are doing. Yeah, that's okay. right. But we will make that better at some point. The, I mean, the primary advantage of the timeline that we've added here, which did not exist in Cascade, is just what why it's doing right now, the ability to scrub. Um, and we'll, we can go backwards and forwards in time. If you go backwards, then we sort of restart the simulation and build back up from time zero to where you are. And if you go forwards, we'll fill in the blanks as well with multiple sort of sim sub steps, uh, which is really, really valuable when you're just like trying to get some aspect of your system just right. You kind of go back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Cascade, you have to wait till the whole thing like reset and cycle. And mm -hmm. it's just a, a workflow improvement. But as you said, there's the other side of the coin where you just want to see it all play out the way it would naturally in the game. It's maybe a little bit unnatural that way. So yeah. you know, we're trying to balance all of these use cases together to give you the <laughs> best experience. And in some cases, we got it right. In some cases, we got it wrong. But that's why it's in early access right now. Uh, the other nice thing is if you set your frame rate to something reasonable, you can use the next to advance forward just a single frame of the sim. And it assumes, it assumes a fixed 30 frame a second time step but you can advance in really discrete segments through your sim and then make changes. It's, it's pretty nice. Cool. Uh, the other thing that's interesting to note here, normally if I'm scrubbing forward, I'm just kind of simulating forward along the timeline. But if I scrub backwards, it's kind of re-simming up to this point. Yeah. It just so happens that my system doesn't, 
it doesn't rely on any randomness. I have a linear marching velocity, I have a linearly changing size, and so it actually looks as if the sim is perfectly rewinding as I move backwards. But what I, what's actually happening is it's kind of re-simulating up to that point every time I drag back. Um, so just a little bit of a quirk of the timeline there. Mm. Um, and we'll see that with later particles. As you yeah, you'll it. see yeah. it where I go back and the whole sim will just kind of twitch out and gotcha. completely re-simulate. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see as we go on. Um, someone's commented that they've, they've encountered with um, a problem with slowing down um, during the playback. It actually, they encounter like flickering and stuff mm. that they didn't feel like they experienced in Cascade. Is that just something that's, as we're growing in yeah, their I mean, software, it's smoothing out? Almost certainly there are bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, again, guaranteed there are bugs. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, Rubber stamp. Um, you know, the best place of doing that is just start reporting whatever issues you see. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe I've seen that particular bug report come through. Mm -hmm. um, and while this is on the 420 um, branch and, and it's sort of, published stream, we also have a Dev Niagara stream mm -hmm. uh, for like GitHub users, which is where the team is actively doing the latest and greatest development. Um, if you're feeling adventurous, uh, you can jump onto that stream. We'll have lots more bug fixes, but you'll also see things that are still actively really in development. So it's a kind of yeah. a double-edged sword there. Right. <laughs> Um, okay, so as far as this effect goes, it's really simple. I give the particles a lifetime. I tell them what their starting size should be. And you'll notice that I'm setting this size here of what they, are sh what they should be up in the particle spawn script. You've, I've got two sections here, what happens when the particle spawns, and then what happens on every frame thereafter. What I'm doing here is I'm saying, I want your size to be six units uh, you know, on, on either direction, basically just a square. Um, and I want you to start off with this velocity. Just go upwards at 50, 50 units a second. Um, these are just my starting values. And so uh, as I get down into the particle update, what happens every frame, I'm now doing some extra work to decide what happens every frame thereafter, which is why we're getting this deviation in the particle size where it's scaling up and it's scaling down and scaling up and scaling down. And uh, I feel like I should explain this here because it's actually a, a, a kind of nested chain of things that are happening, um, which on its surface might be a little bit daunting, but if I break it apart into pieces, it might make a little more sense. So uh, the idea here is, is that every frame, I'm basically scaling the particles from where they were when they started. Uh, and actually, let me open this, guys, so you can see the graph here so I can explain what's happening. What I'm doing is is... I have this special thing here, and I wanted to open this specifically so I could explain this because this is a little bit of kind of tribal Niagara knowledge. Yep. And for those of you who are watching, this isn't quite well documented yet. So uh, the idea here is, is I have this module, and it's reading back the sprite size of the particle that's coming in. How big is the sprite right now? However, it's reading back a special version of that. It's reading back the initial sub namespace of the attribute that we've written. So what this means is, is that when we decide to write to particle sprite size, so I've got in my system, right up here, I'm writing to this attribute, particle sprite size. When I write this guy off, six, six units on X, six units on Y, behind the scenes in the script, I write that, and I also <laughs> write off a little separate attribute called the initial sprite size. So that was the size I set up here before I did any work to it down here. In essence, it gives me a little snapshot of the state of the, of the particle on the first frame when it was spawned. So I can then reference that, and I can scale against it with the scale factor. So you can see I've exposed these things to the nodes here that are like a scale factor which says, how, how big do you want the, the sprite size to scale over time? Um, so I can expose that, and then I basically have a scale factor which gets packed into a little transient value and applied to the size of the particle. If I did this every single frame directly to the size, I would just get an infinitely scaling up or scaling down, because every frame the new size is going to come in and then get scaled up or scaled down by the scale factor and then written back out. But since I'm acting as a scale toward the initial value that we set up in spawn, I always get a nice stable comparison for how big was it when I started versus how big it, do I want it to be now. Um, it's a little hard to understand. Maybe I, it, I overly complicated it, but it, this is a little piece of tribal Niagara knowledge that we want to make sure we express. Yep. <laughs> uh, so I've decided I want to scale it up and down. 
basing it on the size that I set up here. So what am I doing? First of all, I've decided I just want a single value to drive that scale. And in fact, let me kind of rewrite this for you guys live so you can see my thought process here. So I've got a sprite size scale, which is going to scale over life. Right now, it's just set to 1, so they're just stable. Um, if I set this guy to 2, it's just multiplying whatever it was initially by 2, but it's still stable. So I made a couple of decisions along the way. The first thing I decided was, well, I actually want to make a single value drive <laughs> both channels. And so instead of having to type in two values, one for x, one for y, I've made myself a little dynamic input that basically just says, OK, I'm typing one value, and now it's applying to both x and y. And so this little guy that I dropped in there is actually a little module script. And all it's doing is the world's simplest thing, which is taking the number that I type in, assigning it to both x and y, and then spinning it back out as a number that I can use. So I'm just simplifying my life by not having to um, work in two different values or on two different axes. I, I know that I want the x and y to always be equal. And then at that point, now that I've got this value, how do I want to scale it? Well, I, in the example that I made here, I use a sine wave. The sine wave, by default, is going to come in as uh, at point zero on the sine wave, which it turns out uh, is zero. And so I'm scaling all my particles down to nothing. Uh, so what I need to do is index into the sine wave by something that inherently is ever marching forward, is always, basically an angle is always increasing. How do I do that? <laughs> I index it by age. So maybe in this case, I, I could do it by the time uh, of the, the simulation. Or in this case, I'm just going to say, how old is my emitter? What's the age of my emitter in seconds? And I'm just going to index into my sine wave by the age of the emitter. Uh, and so I've got, you know, I can change the, the period of the sine wave so that it happens more rapidly or more slowly, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, and so you get some, some interesting behaviors there. What, what really gets interesting is when you then offset the phase of the uh, age for each different particle. Um, so let me close this and, and restore it so you can see the, uh, the, the state of the union. Oh, actually, it wanted to save itself off, didn't it? OK, maybe I can revert back. Mm -hmm, mm. Well, that's fine. So uh, all I was getting at is that if I'm using this sine wave to drive how big something is, I can then also say, OK, all of them are indexing into the sine wave with the same age, or each different particle can be offset a little bit in time. And that's how we were getting that kind of ripply sinusoidal behavior. Um, you could so also use uh, the particle's individual age to, to drive that as well. And you, that would cause it to, as that particle moved over its life, it would expand and contract and expand and contract. Yeah, totally. I, I regret closing this now because I could have flipped through a couple different versions. But anyway, it's, no, it's not really worth dwelling on other than to say that um, writing to a couple of basic attributes and then using one module here to basically change my scale over life got me a pretty complex behavior. And I was just using a couple of little additional things, some dynamic inputs, throw in a sine wave, index it by the age or the particle or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I'm starting to get something that's fairly complex, even though my graph is really, really, really simple. Um, and that's the goal, basically. So if you're familiar with Cascade, um, it, when he, he said the word dynamic inputs, or that's basically Niagara's way of dealing with what Cascade used to call distributions except we stepped it up to uh, a new level. So in Cascade, you could basically have a, st a single constant value or like a statistical distribution, or you could drive it via like animation, or you could like drive it via blueprint. With Niagara, we basically allowed you to take little custom graph snippets like Wyeth showed you uh, for like taking one value and driving two values on the other side of it. Like all of these things are completely driven by custom graphs that you can create or that we can, as Epic can provide to you to, to drive those parameters in interesting and novel ways. Perfect example here would be the, the world's most common case, which is I, I want to directly have all my particles have a lifetime of four, or I actually want to give them a range. And so I drop in a dynamic input that gives me back a range, and now every particle has a lifetime between zero and one. 
And if I change one of these, I'm now getting every particle has their own discrete lifetime. Every time they spawn, they make a decision, am I somewhere between zero or four? And then they set that as its lifetime, and then it ticks, and they all kind of fade out. <laughs> this little guy here is itself just a little graph script. Uh, and r honestly, the only difference between this and any of the other scripts is we've set it, you know, you can set flags for how they're used to dynamic input. So this one actually, I, I, it's just a bug literally that it's not showing. No, so script. this is showing the context uh, in which it can be used. Oh, so thanks. the dynamic yeah, yeah, inputs. Yeah. That's a type of script. Like you could have a dynamic input that only works for particle update. Or in this case, it's a dynamic up input that doesn't really care which phase of the simulation it's in. Mm -hmm. So you can use it anywhere. Um, that there's different asset types when you create it in the content browser that says Here's where dynamic it shows. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. Here's where it shows the output. Cool. Uh, so we just got another question um, asking, can you use individual material instances for each particle, allowing you to modify the material parameters differently per particle? So you wouldn't use an individual material instance difference per particle. Like you can use dynamic material parameters um, as one mechanism t for each individual particle to to say uh, to expose something to the graph for the material. So we I think support up to sixteen floats now in Niagara. Sixteen. Yep. Yeah. So basically, that th th those are sixteen distinct arbitrary values that you can push into your material and use that to influence the behavior of that material. Maybe it's like you have a couple of different graphs that your material graphs that you're lerping between or mm -hmm. picking between or you're just tweaking values that you know change the color or write to the velocity buffer differently or you know whatever. Um, that's really the mechanism that you would use ideally to drive that. Gotcha. Yeah, and, it, and um, if you just want to send those over once when the particles spawn, you could do that, um, and we have some material parameter. Uh, where I, this is actually being worked on now, so this stuff is going to change a little bit. But um, we basically mm -hmm. have uh, some helper functions which will um, write to a material parameter for you. Um, and so you could basically assign this, OK, I want this, this float. This is the first float in my dynamic input. And I want this to be, I don't know, like I did before. I want this to be a uniform range value between 0 and 1. So every particle that spawns is going to pass this random value between 0 and 1 into the material. Yep. And so I could do that up here just when the particle spawns. Or this same module, the dynamic material parameters module, we could put it down in update. And then every frame, I'm sending it new information. Gotcha. And per particle, it's going to get its own version of that script. So I think you could have tons of randomness. Um, Seems very like you can come up with a lot of like really cool particles with just that. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the interaction between particles and materials yeah. gets real funky That's real awesome. quick. Yeah, it's great. Uh, okay, so this guy is uh, an example of our mesh renderer, uh, mesh emitter. Um, I should express where this is actually coming from. So if you look at this guy, let me just pull him off. For Looks once. like DNA kind of. Yes, it yeah. does have that quality to it. So this guy is uh, a a sprite renderer, and pull them back on. I've actually just assigned a sprite renderer down here. Okay, um, that's how this guy has decided it wants to emit sprites from these points. This guy is doing the same type of simulation, the other guy, except I have assigned a mesh renderer instead, and I've just assigned it this little gnomon mesh that we made for visualization. Um, Someone was asking, so. The you know the little yellow arrows reset the values back to zero, but mm -hmm. you said there were some little green ones as well. Yes. What do those do? Okay, so <laughs> that one's <laughs> going to take a little bit of detail. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> let me get started f really quick. So there's a notion of a system, and there's a notion of an individual emitter. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and an emitter is just sort of like. Uh, an individual track where you've created particles, they live and they die, they have different behaviors for that particular particle set. Um, but in reality, no effect is done with just a single emitter, or nothing interesting is done with one, one simple emitter. Mm -hmm. You actually have to create a set of emitters that are interacting together. But uh, you can create emitters that are, you know, more often in an artist's workflow, they'll create emitters that they do once, they get it kind of the way that they want, and it's like some primitive, like a little smoke burst or a little bit of fire or something. You get that exactly the way that you want, yeah. and then you pull that into your system, and you tweak the values a little bit more within the context of that system. Uh -huh. So they might have a little 
smoke bit as one emitter, little flame coming up, and now you've got the flame with the smoke together, that those two emitters would be part of the system. Okay. Now, to make it things a little bit more complicated but more powerful, <laughs> Niagara remembers the relationship between that original emitter file that you had for the smoke uh -huh. and the one that you have in the system. And so when you tweak a value in the system, it knows that it's different from the one that was originally mm. in that emitter. Okay. That green arrow reverts you back to the value on that original emitter. Okay. The yellow arrow reverts you back to like the default value for like a float or mm. um, like a VEC3 or whatever. Okay. It's a little complicated and we can probably do a better job of like doing the visual representation of that, but that's the general idea of what's going on. No, that makes sense. Thanks. Cool. All right, so um, there are a couple of things at play here, um, all of them pretty straightforward. The first one is basically just saying, what do I want my initial rotation to be? Well, what we're doing is we're saying, I want your initial rotation to actually be your velocity, your initial mesh rotation. And so if I disable the particles spinning over life, you can see them just spraying out of the emitter. And as they spray out, you can see they're actually deviating. They're actually rotating a little bit. They're turning. They're not continuing to be, you know, faced in the, the kind of cardinal directions that you would expect if you weren't doing this initialization of the rotation. So I'm not actually giving this guy any additional yaw, pitch, or roll um, that would kind of spin it, although you can see I'm getting a different result because I'm saying, orient to velocity and also spin. Uh, and in fact, if I just gave this, like, let's say a random number, oops, typing, let me just give this a random value from zero to 360 degrees. Now I'm aligning it to velocity and I'm spinning 360 around the pitch axis. So you can see I'm, I'm only spinning on that one axis, the other, the other axis is velocity aligned. Um, but the fundamental idea here is I have linked intrinsically two things that you wouldn't normally associate with going with each other. So I, I, I have this module which sets what is my initial orientation, and I'm just saying, okay, I'm going to go in and I'm going to link a particle attribute, which is its velocity, right here, velocity, to that orientation. And so this is just happening when the particle spawns, and I'm not updating that thereafter yet. I'm just saying, when you spawn, this is the direction you're pointing. Um, and then I have your st my standard stuff here, like this is how, you know, how long lived I want the particles to be, and this is how big I want them to, to start off. And these are all just kind of default attributes of mesh emitters, scale versus sprite size being the most notable one. Mm -hmm. um, and then down here, uh, I have this additional rotation rate module. Um, and this guy is basically just saying, I want a constant rotation rate on these other two axes. And so I start off by pointing myself the way I want based on its velocity, and then from there, I let my little update script take over and spin them a little bit more every single frame, just accumulating more rotation as life goes on. And then the last thing I do is, is I basically have a little curve here. And the curve uh, is deciding that I want to start off really slow or really small, and then I scale up to my full size or maybe even a little bit bigger than that, and then by the time my lifetime reaches one, I'm back down at scale zero. Um, and actually, this is a good chance for me to talk about how we do curve in indexing. Um, so I've got this thing which is basically saying my particle's small, gets bigger, gets back down. Every point along this curve, this curve is normalized, so it starts at zero, it ends at one. How I index into the curve is completely programmable. Right now, I'm doing the kind of the cascade thing, the thing that you would generally do with particles by default is I'm indexing into the curve based on the normalized age of the particle. Okay, what does normalized age mean? Basically, it just means that no matter how long my particle lives, when it's born, that normalized age is zero, and when it dies, the normalized age is one. And we just do the math in between to fit that zero to one linearly along the age of the particle. So that, that one is the particle lifetime, generally speaking. Like, the variable that he said earlier is usually the variable that you set to say, this is how long I want it to live. So right. this is how old it would be in seconds uh, when it dies. So you have your age, which is, or you have your lifetime, how old am I? 
you have your age, which is relative to this value. So I might have a particle which is uh, age of 2.9 out of 3. And then I have normalized age, which is what percentage of 2.9 out of 3 am I wow. uh, in 0 to 1. And so I get both of those values, and I can do work with both of those values, and, and I can use that to index into the, the, the curve. Uh, so if I indexed into this curve directly, like if I don't, like if I just set a local value, I'm just going to make a, I'm just going to set a float here. Every one of these particles, every frame says, oh, I'm at here on the curve. I'm at zero on the curve. Now, every particle is halfway into the curve. And so all of them are as big as this point on the curve now. Because I'm saying, I have a value of 0.5. That's where I'm looking up into the curve to be. And so you see that behavior here. Every particle is as big as it will ever be along the curve. Because at, at 0.5 is its, its highest point. Um, now, one question that people who have done a lot of visual effects might ask is like, why use normalized age and why not use regular age? Um, and I think uh, an important thing is like you're often experimenting with lifetime, and sometimes lifetime's not even uh, static across all your particles. Like we've seen the uniform distribution, so you might have some particles live one second, some particles live five seconds. Using normalized age is a way, really easy and convenient way for you to work in a space where the units don't really matter so much. You can actually just say, over the course of the life of a particle, I, I, I use this particular mm -hmm. scheme. Right. Um, and it makes, it makes it easier so you don't have to rekey things as you change values. It's just real simple to work with. Yeah. Gosh. So powerful. It is. It's like a drug. It's quite addictive, <laughs> actually. You start to play with it, and then two hours go by, and you forget you actually had things to do. Uh, so we got another question coming in. Uh, is there an easy way to navigate from system to emitter? Uh, this user doesn't see any way oh, yeah. to find in content browser button. Yeah, I, w we will fix that. In the meantime, if you're in a system, open and focus source emitter pops you right to the emitter that you are actually referencing in the system. Gotcha. Uh, so that's the easiest way to jump. Uh, also, there are some helper things in here that are they're not discoverable right now, but I use them a lot, which is if I right click and do collapse to headers, boop, it collapses to a nice collapsed view of my whole stack, so mm -hmm. I get an overview. And you can, we can actually, that's actually bound to a key if you want it to be. So you can go into the key bindings and bind that. So I have it bound, and you just hit one button, collapses the stack, and you get your overview. Nice. It's kind of a nice little user. And there's some other options in here that you can see. You can jump to, like, down into the particle update, and it'll, if these were expanded out, it would have jumped right to this mm -hmm. section. So mm -hmm. some nice little shortcuts there. Nice. That's awesome. This is... I, I'm going to start playing with this now. Like <laughs> it, uh, it's a lot of fun. There are also some questions. They're saying they're having a hard time finding rotation, and that was only relevant to mesh? Yeah, so that's actually um, basically just an oversight okay. on our part, which is we <laughs> didn't get a chance. We didn't get to including a robust set of rotation rate over life modules. Mm. It's just one of the missing module library things that's a really common behavior that we just literally didn't get around to. Oh, okay. um, that should make it into probably the next release yeah. <laughs> the next iteration will have more robust in the meantime our dynamic inputs could accomplish that for you mm -hmm. by giving you a sprite rotation value that you increment over time you could probably use our current tool to do that but we don't have that really handy hey i want to do sprite rotation drop <laughs> module in right. we as yeah. as as the creators of the tool have to provide all that stuff to the user so yeah. that that is coming you guys will have so so what, what are you saying is you could use that the set variables node to set particles dot sprite rotation which you can then use a dynamic input to like drive it via a curve or, you know, a statistical distribution or, or whatever, mm -hmm. and that will work for sprites. Since sprites are b always facing the camera, you're really just adjusting like how it's spinning relative to the camera. Um, whereas, you know, with mesh rotation, you can do completely arbitrary uh, orientations in 3D space. Hmm. Um, okay, so this is an example of a GPU emitter. Um, CPU and G GPU emitters are, let me move this out of the way for a sec, are, um, there are fewer differences between Cascade and, or, and, you know, Cascade had more CPU and GPU differences than Niagara does. Um, but there's still some things like collisions where that we just completely handle differently on the GPU. We do depth buffer collisions instead of doing actual line traces and stuff on the CPU. Um, if you want to make an emitter, a GPU emitter, uh, that's done here. Uh, sorry, up in the emitter properties. Um, so you have a SIM target, which is either a CPU SIM or a GPU compute SIM. Um, so you just toggle this, and then everything 
for the most part, should just work. I'm putting that in quotes because there are plenty of things that don't just work. But, but <laughs> the goal, the long-term goal, is that we have a lot of parity between CPU and GPU. Predominantly, you, you're going to find that your biggest differences in our data interface area. And when we get to data interfaces, Sean and I can talk about those, those differences. Over time, we will be making those more minimal. But one of the aspects of GPU simulation that's very attractive is you can generally simulate many more points. Um, at, at one time. Some, there are certain things you can't do with them, but it is very good for having large numbers of points for simulation, so we tend to lean on that when we're showing off GPU sim. Um, yeah, there was some discussion or question around, like, what do you generally prefer, uh, or not prefer, but, like, in what cases would you use CPU versus GPU? Mm -hmm. the, I mean, I think there are a lot of effects that are fairly simple. I mean, it really depends on, a lot of it depends on your game itself. Mm -hmm. uh, in some games, you're very GPU bound. In which case, every GPU simulation you create it just keeps adding to that that overhead. Yeah. A lot of games have very simple effects where they're you know you don't need thousands or millions of particles. You just need like tens or hundreds. Uh -huh. In which case, going the expense of going to the GPU, there's there's not going to be that big it's of a difference performance wise, yeah. right? So you mm -hmm. can do it on the CPU. Mm -hmm. It really depends on like where your bottlenecks are. Okay. Um, and in some future world, Niagara might even <laughs> be able to figure that out based off of the the state of the game. Ooh. Nowhere near th y that yet, <laughs> but that's yeah. some of the directions that we're thinking. Cool. Uh, so in this example, uh, I'm using a burst to spawn 2,500 particles just once, just right at the on the first frame of the emitter um, looping. Uh, I basically say, hey, I want, I want 2,500 particles. The reason I get this kind of erratic spawned behavior where I'm getting little clumps of them uh, you know, it's almost like a staccato spawning, like 2,500, and then a, a little gap of time, and then 2,500, 2,500, pop, 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 is because I'm actually doing that in the emitter looping itself. So I'm basically saying, in between every loop, I want to delay some fraction of a second that's random every single time I come around in the, through the life cycle. Uh, and then how long those loops are is also random. So when you take two random numbers and kind of combine them, you're going to get a kind of a you know, staccato rhythm, uh, and so I'm managing that here, and then I basically just say on the first frame, hey, spawn, spawn some particles. Um, and then I'm doing some simple stuff like uh, uniform ranges for the particle lifetime. They live from between four and six seconds, and they have sizes between, so on and so on. Uh, we got another question in. Yeah. Uh, are there any performance metrics yet for Niagara versus Cascade? Performance is one of the areas where we're going to be putting a lot of emphasis now that 420 has shipped. Um, you know, there are definitely cases where we know we're faster than Cascade, um, just in things like trying to do ribbons in particular uh, has been a from the ground up rethink. Um, but that's just part of the thing that we need to do to really get this in the, get us out of early access is focus a lot on performance and especially in actual shipped games and on shipped content. That's, yeah. you know, one of the areas where we're going to be really focusing in the next few months. I would mm -hmm. say we're generally really optimistic about performance, but we haven't spent enough time to say the numbers. Gotcha. And there's a follow-up to that is, uh, is Niagara cross-platform cross ready? There, the goal is once we come out of early access that it will right. be fully cross-platform. Because it's early access, we don't want to say, hey, go use it on uh, a finished product, right? Like, correct, correct. Yeah. Um, you know, we've spent more time on some platforms than others, uh, especially mobile. Uh, we need to devote a lot more time, um, especially because in many of them, especially like Android handsets, there's a lot of variety of shader models right. and things supported on the Android headsets, and we need to really fine-tune some of the algorithms to be able to run acceptably mm -hmm. on that. So short answer is, you know, expect to be able to play around quite well with it on PC, um, you know, PlayStation and Xbox should be fine. Uh, as you get further away from that, we've spent less time on it, and that's where we're going to be investing moving forward. Good. Cool. Thanks. So uh, when we get to the particle updating, we've got a simple curve that just says start out small, get big, and uh, get small again by the time you uh, are, are done. And then... Uh, the first kind of interesting thing in here is we're, uh, um, this is the first use of what we're calling our forces. And we have a number of forces. We've got attraction forces and, you know, basically acceleration, which you could use for gravity. Um, we've got forces for injecting kernel noise into the sim or just random kind of directional forces like wind, that kind of stuff. 
So basically the idea here is, is that it's just a way to influence your simulation by injecting some, some force which gets turned into a velocity. Um, and so in this case, we're look, curl noise is, is basically just a, a big swirl of s swoopy vectors. <laughs> I don't know a better <laughs> way to explain that uh, in a layman terms, vectors. but the official term. picture a big cloud of swoopy vectors. Now we've, uh, had, we've had dangly bits and swoopy vectors. We, yes, that's the, <laughs> these are important takeaways. We're going to make sure they get into the docs. Yeah. <laughs> um, technical terminology. Technical, highly technical, yep. yep. Um, <laughs> my, my PhD is showing off. <laughs> I don't have a PhD. Um, so basically we're just saying like, hey, wherever a particle is in this cloud of swoopy vectors, apply some strength based on that direction. And so it's just a big cloud of really, really smooth, interesting noise basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we go ahead and inject that into the simulation. And then in order to keep the particles kind of together, we also have this attractor. And so the attractor basically just says, hey, from the center of the particle system, based on some sort of fall-off exponent and a radius, like 300 units, here's how strong I want you to attract me back to the center. And it has a, you know, kind of a inverse square fall-off effect. The further away it is, the stronger the, the pull. Uh, and I can crank up the strength, and they're, they're just going to want to be pulled in toward the center more aggressively as I do that. So you can see them starting to be pulled in. Um, and if I turn off the curl noise, you'll see just a much more literal version of this, um, where they're just clumps respond, and then they get pulled back to the middle. So folks are wondering if you can add, remove, or even modify some of these modules or emitters at runtime. Well, so uh, anything that, that is the, these parameters here could be exposed and spoken to with Blueprint. Okay. So I could expose a user parameter that I want Blueprint to drive, mm -hmm. and that I could link that user parameter down into the, the, the value, and then I could tell Blueprint to like, hey, you care about this parameter, write to it. Yeah. Um, and it will update that in real time. Excellent. Yep. Yeah, but and you can drive anything with that. Yeah, it, in, in some ways you can think about this similar to uh, blueprints in that in themselves, like these modules, you wouldn't be able to create modules really. Like you're not okay. doing blueprint scripting at runtime. Mm -hmm. um, similar idea. This actually all gets baked into um, HLSL code behind the scenes and compiled away for you, just kind of like materials do. Um, and we can actually target it, the HLSL towards a high performance vector machine on the CPU or the actual GPU, um, which is pretty, it's a pretty cool aspect of the technology, actually. It lets us do things that not, other, not many other people can actually do. Are those parameters also exposed to C++? Yeah, yeah, they're just, just function calls on the, mm -hmm. the Niagara component itself. It's like set vec4 with the name and the value, and it gotcha. will push that parameter through the pipeline. Yep. Cool. Yeah, oh, that one looks cool. So, so this effect was built to show off one very specific thing, uh, and, and the surface of it, it's, it's simple. Um, it's like gravity almost. So basically, this was built to show off the idea of these renderer bindings. Um, so let me collapse this guy. Um, down here we have our renderer, our sprite renderer. And the sprite renderer relies on these um, bindings to tell it what to care about to use for rendering. Uh, what do I mean by that? Because that's kind of an obtuse statement. When the sprite renderer decides where it's going to put the sprite, so each one of these guys is just a sprite, it's a, it's a quad, um, the, the renderer decides where it's going to put it for each point that's simulating based on this binding. So right now, the, the position of the particle is bound to the position binding for the renderer. However, let's say that I made a new parameter. Let's say I made <laughs> particles dot offset position. I could go down into the renderer and I could assign, and it would show up here because it's in the, the, the particle payload. I could choose offset position. And now, let's say I gave just a random vector, like a random offset from that initial particle position. As soon as I bind that, now it's going to put the sprite in that position instead. And so I have this completely kind of arbitrary link between my simulation and then what the renderer is doing. And I can drive the renderer arbitrarily with data. So um, we have these ideas of these, these kind of bindings. One of the bindings is a default one called sprite facing. And sprite facing just says, what am I looking at? So by default, the, the sprites face the camera. Um, and in fact, let me see if I can just disable the... Um, the stuff that, that is making this spin for a sec to make if it a you, little bit. If you set the, can the, the mask down at the bottom, wouldn't that? Yeah, I just I want to turn off the, the spinning first. Yeah, okay. Um, to make it a little bit more. 
So I think we will see. Let me just test this. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, <laughs> now they're not spinning around. They're, they're basically just um, facing one specific vector. You can see down in this binding, I, I have this guy. There's particles sprite facing. That is a vector. And that is deciding where the particles are facing. If I change the facing mode to face camera, all these sprites now just face me. So they just say, hey, I'm spawned, and I look at you. If I change this to custom facing vector, now they are listening to this guy that I showed you down here, particle sprite facing. And what I've done in this example is I've written to this guy, and I've said, I want you to face the vector which is between the center of this little ball and where the particle is. And so you can see they actually kind of, they're always turning to face the center. And as they spin around toward the edge, you can see them kind of like conforming to that sphere. So now they're, they're spinning around and they're locked to the surface of the sphere mm -hmm. because they're always looking inward. They're always facing this direction which is in toward the center of the emitter. Um, where this gets interesting is that you can update that value over time. And so, um, when the particle spawns, I'm basically saying, hey, wait, where is sprite facing? Here it is. It's in here. <laughs> <laughs> I always have to find the right place. Um, I have this value where I'm, I'm basically like, the, the particle is always being driven as the particle update happens by this new vector that I've made. If I wanted to just do that on spawn, they would just carry on and they would never reorient themselves. I could just tell them, hey, face to the east or whatever, and they're always just going to be locked to that way. But if I'm updating that vector every frame, you get a more elaborate result. So let me show that here. I basically have this particle sprite facing vector, this guy that I was talking about, and I've just put in a dynamic input to rotate that vector. And so what I'm doing is, is that every you know two seconds or whatever, I use a sine wave to lerp in how much rotation I'm taking from this, this guy here. And so you can see them all flip over. And so I'm, I'm telling them, hey, face the middle, and then over time, flip every so often just to give a more elaborate behavior. Um, this is just uh, you know, showing some of the more complex things you can do with this idea. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show in this effect, which is interesting, is I have this idea of creating a vortex motion um, by spinning particles around an axis. And then in order to get them to swirl around the sphere like this, I basically just pick a random, s little random p vector right through the middle of the sphere. So picture me putting, like sticking a pole randomly into it and then spinning the particles around it. Um, that's kind of an interesting behavior that you get um, with this vortex velocity module um, based on me just picking a random axis and then spinning them around that axis. So it looks more complex than it actually is. Um, this is another really, really simple one. And this one is basically just saying, how far away am I from the origin of the emitter? And based on that distance, I'm going to return a value. I'm basically going to say, well, I'm up to 300 units. I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm this far away. I normalize that. So what percentage of that distance am I along it? And then I use that to blend between things like how, how big am I and what color am I? And the reason this one is included in the samples is this is a really fundamental Niagara thing. The idea that you would take an arbitrary piece of information and then drive um, pieces of simulation you know, performance with that arbitrary data, that's like the, the, the core fundamental idea of the tool, really. Um, and so this is a simple way to visualize doing that. Um, that looks neat. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is one of those things where, oh, um, I don't know if it's worth going into this. I guess I will because it's a little bit of kind of tribal, not really tribal knowledge, but something that's important for people who are trying to get a little bit, maybe a little bit more advanced with the tool. You can see here I'm making, I made myself a variable, and I, and I, I made it through here. I, in the, I basically just hit the plus sign and added a new variable, and I called it this temp distance from center. The name of this matters. And the name of this matters because it is making a decision about whether this value that I'm calculating is making it into the permanent parameter map, the permanent attributes of the particle. If I had named this particles.distance from center, 
then I'm in essence packing it into the payload to be accessed either through an event or uh, you know, and on the next frame of the simulation. I'm, I, I want that back. Hey, the thing that I cared about, I want you to save it off and I want it back. There's an inherent cost to that. Since I made myself a little, little temporary namespace, temp.whatever, this, this value is being calculated. So it, the, the particle, every frame is running this logic. It gets to this, does this little bit of math, calculates it, uses it until the end of this step, and then throws it away. That's inherently a more kind of inexpensive way or at least lighter weight way to handle some of this stuff that we want to calculate. And because I'm recalculating this guy every frame and I'm not dependent on what it was the frame before, I just want, what, what am I now? How far am I away right. now? And give me back a value. Do this now. Do this now. I don't care about what you were last frame. Right. Then I can do it in a temporary way that is just more lightweight. Uh, and so this is showing that. It's almost like fine-tuning it, right? Like it's just, a w the, this is a little value. I just want to give it a nudge, and I, I don't care if it's persistent to gotcha. me. And um, the value of putting it here in the set variables module is he can create that variable once, do the logic to set it, and then bind it in multiple places downstream. So he can bind it in the color and in like the sprite size scale. He can use that, b that one value that he's previously computed in multiple different contexts. Yeah, and, and actually, uh, thank you, by the way, Cannabis Coder, if you're watching. A friend on uh, the forums and Discord pointed out that, that we actually do have a display bug right now. So in 420, right now, this variable says that it is called distance from center. It's actually not. It's actually called normalized distance from center. Oh. It's a renaming bug that didn't update the UI. So anyway, if you're opening this and you are confused, there's a very good reason. <laughs> uh, so Appropriately so. This variable is actually called temp normalized distance from center, which is down here, and we will fix this for the next release. Uh, so I'm writing to that value, this guy here. I do that calculation once, uh, and then I'm using it in two places. So I'm doing this calculation here, and then I have a color module which is blending between blue and red based on that distance. How far away am I from the middle? Uh, and it's using that as the warp factor for these two colors. And so because this value was calculated as a zero to one distance between, you know, between the middle and how far away I am, I can use that zero to one to drive a lerp. And so I do that. So I, I basically just have made this guy here. And then down here, I, I chose link inputs. And I picked my little value, normalized distance from center, boom. And then that's now my lerp factor for the color. And then I do the same thing for sprite size. So when they're at their smallest, when they're at the middle, when that value is at its lowest, I want you to be small. And then I want you to be bigger when that value is at its highest. Uh, and now <laughs> I'm assigning the same value, the same 0 to 1, how far away am I value um, to, the, to the simulation. So that's a really, this seems like an easy thing, but this is like a fundamental Niagara thing. This is like really, truly how you get power out of the tool, is by doing some calculations and then using them all over your simulation to make things look really complex, even mm. though they're actually kind of simple. That's awesome. Uh, we've got two examples of beams. Um, it's probably not worth going crazy, crazy deep into these because they'll be somewhat self-explanatory. The one thing I will say that's interesting about the way we handle beams in uh, Niagara versus how we handled them in Cascade is that we, they inherently aren't their own object. What I mean by that is they are just linked together points that I'm already simulating exactly how I would have simulated any other collections of particles. And I've left the point visualizations into this example when you look at it to show you that, yes, these are linked together into these ribbons, but each individual point along the way is being affected by my simulation as if they were all their own individual point. Uh, so uh, the, the amount of control you get over Niagara beams, um, which are basically just ribbons that happen to be stitched together in a, in a good way, um, is that level of program programmability. They're, they're just way more powerful than they were in Cascade. You can do so much more. Um, we've provided a number of, of setup modules that, that handle beams for you. Um, these are all set up with dependencies. Uh, and so one thing to, to show that off is this module here that says, hey, I'm going to spawn a beam. When the particle spawns, I'm going I'm to stitch together these discrete chunks of particles into a beam shape is reliant on 
in, at the emitter level knowing some information. Like where's the start point of the beam? Where's the end point of the beam? What's the dr scale factors that are driving it? That, that kind of stuff. I need to do some work up at the emitter level and some work up at down in the particle spawn level. The way we rectify that is by with de using some dependencies. So you can see I've disabled this setup module. It turns out that this guy, this module, depends on that in order to function. And so it's complaining, hey, I've, I've got an unmet dependency. I really need beam emitter setup. Why did you turn it off? Uh, and so I can say, oh, yeah, you're right. Fix <laughs> issue. And it'll turn it back on if right. it's just disabled. Or it will actually add it for you and put it in the right place if it's missing entirely. Um, I was wondering, can you have beams follow a particular path? And if not, you know, what would be the best way of like sure. a lightning-esque mm -hmm. particle? Yep. So, um, so right now, these beams are just the, the start and the end point. Well, the start point, I'm just saying, hey, I want you to be the middle of the emitter. And then the end point, I'm, b I'm basically just picking a random vector. So I'm saying, I want you to just randomly pick a vector of this length between 220 and 340 and just point the beam in that direction. Mm -hmm. If I had a specific direction or a point in space, like I did a line trace in Blueprint, like, yeah. hey, I'm going to trace a line from a gun or whatever, I could basically just programmatically link that to a user value for my endpoint of the beam, okay. and then I would drive that with code Very cool. uh, or with whatever you want. Right. Um, so yeah, and, and as far as following a path, we also have ways to have particles follow spines. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a spline, if you drop a spline component into the world, you can assign a data interface to interact with that and you could actually have them follow a spline and you could stitch them together along the spline by saying, hey, I'm at the first part of the spline, I want you to be one end of the beam and oh, I'm at the end of the spline, I want you to be at the other end and it will stitch all the way along. Um, so it is literally 100% programmable, you can do whatever you want. I guess is the, s <laughs> is the summary. It can um, do all the things. It can do all the things, yeah. <laughs> um, in this case, I'm spawning a beam once, but I'm not updating the start and end points every frame. So I, I'm basically just saying, when the particle spawns, make me into beams, um, and then set like how, how big am I, and stuff like that. And then down here, this is interesting because I'm using the exact same force that I was using in the GPU emitter example. So I had this GPU emitter that had this curl noise force, this bucket of random directions, and I was pushing, gracefully pushing the particles along those directions. I'm using that same force, but now I'm pushing the particle, the individual particles of the beam along. And so beams are less of a black box now. They are just simply collections of points, and you can simulate them just like you would any other. We just happen to have some extra logic in there that says, hey, which of you are stitched together into a row? Mm. Uh, and we're doing that help. We're, we have helper functions to do that. Mm -hmm. But once you've done that, once they've been stitched together and they know the other buddies of theirs that are related, you can do all the normal stuff you would do to simulate them by putting all the, 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 the same point attractors, the same forces, the same data interface calls, the same curl noises, the same you know influences from actors or bones or blueprint. They're much less of a black box than they were. That's um, awesome. And a lot more powerful. Man, there's just, there's so much to Niagara. It's incredible. It's, like it's I said, I'm going to go home and play with it. Like, <laughs> please, please <laughs> do. Uh, we need the feedback. Yeah. Not just from the people in the community. Everybody, use yeah. this thing. Give, <laughs> us, yeah. give us feedback. Um, I will also say, I should just clarify, beams, in, in Cascade, we had ribbons and beams, and they were different things. Mm -hmm. In Niagara, it's all one unified idea, ribbons. If they're statically sticked, stitched together based on a start and end point using our helper functions, then they, we, we're calling them beams just because people are going to search for beam because they're used to yeah. cascade and they're just used to this stuff. Right. Um, but y there's no fundamental difference between ribbons that are left behind when a trail falls or whatever and these other than we have helper functions to stitch them together for you. So hold on for just a second because this yeah. is another chance to talk about another thing that Niagara can do that uh, was not really something Cascade dealt with. So we've got an, one emitter, but as you can see here, we've actually got two different renderers on that mm. one emitter. Great example, um, yep. <clears throat> In this case, Naga, as, as, as Wyeth was saying, we're drawing the individual point sprites um, that made up the ribbon and the ribbon itself joining them together. Um, the cool thing, and combine that with like the previous example where you could actually see what... Um, variables you were driving for any individual, any individual render. So you could actually have like two sprite renderers on this guy mm -hmm. and have one be the regular particles dot position and another one be like particles dot offset position. Yep. And you could see both of them together. And by changing which values the renderer is looking up 
and using you could have you could have the same one emitter driving two different things on screen yep. uh, with different materials on them, et cetera. So and we like actually managed to get that as an example in, too, so we'll be able to get to that once okay. you can see it in action. Which Jumping is ahead, sorry. No, 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 it's <laughs> perfect, but it's, you're exactly right. That's, like, that's such an interesting fundamental thing about Niagara is simulate once and render multiple times. That's, as, there's a lot of efficiencies to be had there. So you can see here I've disabled the, the ribbon renderer, so now you're just seeing the sprite renderer. Um, and you can actually do a lot of really, really cool things with this as well, because now you have the control of spacing particles along beams, uh, but not actually rendering the beam. So you know, energy weapons that have these points or, you know, sub-UV animated materials or some, whatever craziness you want to do, um, the points are ribbons and vice versa. It's all the same idea. Um, and so let me disable the sprite renderer now, and now you just see the ribbon renderer. Huh. Um, another aspect of this that I wanted to bring up is, is sort of a pro tip. Um, you can use this for debugging as well. Like, say you've got your ribbons and you're not really sure why they're not looking correct. Like, turning on the sprite renderer lets you see where all the individual vertices are of the ribbon. Mm -hmm. Be like, oh, okay, I think I understand what's going wrong here. So it's like another aspect of it that's really valuable that you don't w normally think about, but you can actually see the data um, with multiple renders. Uh, right. I should also say one more thing about these because I think for people who want to get into working with these ribbons, there's only really one thing that's really important for you to know about how we decide how to stitch them together is that we actually have a particle attribute that does it. You don't have to necessarily care about how I've written this script here. The, the one thing that is going to be interesting to you is I basically get every particle that I'm spawning along the ribbon. Let's say I'm spawning 100 of them and I divide out its number based on how many I spawned, which all it's doing here is passing me back a normalized value from zero to one of how many particles I spawned on that frame. So if I spawned 100 points and I want them all to go into a ribbon, I, you know, I basically get a zero to one value along the, their uh, spawn index. Like, mm -hmm. hey, I'm particle zero, I'm particle point three, and so on. Right. And I do, you know, I calculate its position on a spline and do a bunch of other stuff, but the, the most important thing to see is that I'm writing this order, this execu uh, normalized value of how far along am I, is, am I supposed to be along the beam, I'm writing it to this parameter. So this is called ribbon link order. And this says, it's, it just says, am I bigger? Am, if I'm written to this and I'm bigger, then I'm further along in the ribbon. And so if I had a 100 particles and each one of them has a little incrementing value from the one next to it, the ribbon is going to choose to link them together in what, wherever they are in space, it's going to stitch them together. Mm -hmm. So if I just happen to spawn them gracefully along a spline like I'm doing here, I'm saying, hey, each one of you guys pick your little position on a spline and that's where you live, then I can stitch them together and it actually makes a nice, lovely little curve for the beam. Right. Um, but this ribbon link order, you can do whatever you want. And so you could have random numbers. So particles are just randomly linking beams with each other. And mm -hmm. like you, you could do a lot of really fun stuff. So I highly encourage you to start write, put a ribbon renderer in and just start writing fun values to ribbon link order. And you're going to see interesting things happen. And that's going to start to get you some understanding of how you stitch beams together. Um, this guy's the same. The only important thing to see here is if I simulate, um, the, the, the beam is recalculating its spline every frame. And so I'm, I'm basically just saying every frame, I'm going to decide where, what my position is along this spline, which I'm dynamically updating by changing the start and end point and the start and end tangent, which is kind of the control handle for where the beam is, the, the, the spline is you know, pulling off into space or whatever. Um, and so you can spawn static beams, which are just kind of spawn it and forget and let the simulation take over, or you can do what we're calling dynamic beams, which has an updated position every single frame. So there's examples of both. And then this one has a fun little added benefit of doing a spiral around that using one of our helper modules, which is pretty cool. Um, here's the visualization of what Sean was explaining before, which was the multiple renderers. This is one point simulation. So each one of these little guys that's flying around is just simulating once, um, just swirling some points around random vectors. Um, the renderers on top of them are many. So I, I've, I've added a sprite renderer, I've added a mesh renderer, and I've added a ribbon renderer, which is 
the, and the ribbons are linking together by how old the particles are, which is the default behavior for ribbons. So if a, my, if a particle is newer than the one in front of it, it links the, the particles together. Um, and so you can see here I've got three emitter, three renderers assigned, um, but I'm only simulating those points once. Um, and you already saw down in the, in the emitter itself where I assigned those renderers. But that, that's a good example there of the debugging capability. So now he's assigned a, the, the arrow is the direction that the velocity is pointing in, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually see visually which way the, the particle's choosing for velocity, which is kind of useful. Yep, awesome for debugging. I'm um, wondering if you can, uh, can you define preset renderers like you can with emitters? You mean like ones that have presets of like different settings that they're looking oh, for? Oh, like a default, like a, hey, I like this material and I like its settings. Mm -hmm. We haven't done that yet, yeah. but we think that that will probably be captured by inheritance, which is you make an emitter you like, like in Fireball or something, yeah. you get it in a state you like, and then you inherit it into a bunch of systems, mm. and they kind of comes along for the ride. All the settings that you like, oh, I'm really happy with the hotness of that Fireball or whatever, those will kind of come along, and then you can fiddle the numbers and tweak them. Okay. Um, so I think that's kind of our answer to that, basically. Um, so this guy is worth dwelling on a little bit. I know we don't have infinite time, um, so I want to get through a couple more of these. But um, this guy is important for one particular reason, uh, because it shows how events work. And events are, um, I think I would s the best way to say it is events are in their infancy yeah. in for how we feel like the end game is for how they're supposed to be designed. So events may very well drastically change over the course of the development of Niagara as it moves out of early access and into uh, a real boy tool that we think people are going to ship on. I love we, that yeah, real boy. big boy tool. Um, we, we, it, they may have, this paradigm might, might shift. Um, but for now, uh, this is where it stands, and it's actually monstrously powerful in its current state. We may just make it a little bit more kind of slick, so to speak. But the basic idea here is, is that I have two emitters. I actually technically have three in this in this system. Let me make this guy bigger. Um, I've got a event generator, and let me just turn off these other two guys for a second. I've got this particle that's just fl flinging these guys out, and they, they don't have much interesting to their simulation other than a little bit of gravity. Um, so I, c I kick them out, they start to fall down. These guys, every single frame, are generating ev an event, a little ping that says, hey, here's where I am, okay? Uh, and they're doing that down in the update script. So that's literally happening every single frame. They're saying, hey, here I am, here I am, here I am. And we have these preset payloads in the events. So this event is actually a struct, and it is a struct of data. So every frame, this particle is saying, here I am, here's my position, here's how fast I'm going, if I can make ribbons, here's an ID for those, here's how old I am, and then I'm also, here's a random number that's just coming along for the ride because that's really useful in a bunch of stuff. So we packed it in here. Um, and so every frame, it's just sending out this information. Um, and then we have these listeners here that are saying that, that have, oh, and one other thing before I move on, I'm sending this event at the very end of my update. And this is important. This is going to catch somebody, which is why I'm going to dwell on it for 30 seconds. <laughs> I have my particle update here. I'm managing how old the particle is, I'm applying some acceleration, I'm telling it how, what color it's supposed to be, and then I solve all of the stuff. And when I say solve, I'm saying I, I've injected a bunch of theoretical velocity, I've made changes, right? I want it to the positions to update. I've got a new, I've got, it's traveling at a particular speed, I had an old position, let me apply that speed and give it a new position. So I do that work, I say here's where I'm going to end up. At the whole end of the frame, after all my calculations, here's where I'm going to be after applying all these things. Then I send the event. This is important because now I'm being accurate about where I am. If I, send, if I drag, I can't drag it because I'm inherited, but if I was in the emitter, if I drag this guy up above the solver, I'm going to say, hey, here I am, and then I'm going to advance forward in time to my new position, so I'm going to be off. Yeah. It, it's not going to give me the correct result. And mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of e executing from the top down, so it's important that I'm putting this, this location event generator in the right place. So I hope that made sense, but that's, uh, that's, it's meaningful, which is why I mention it. And then I've got these receivers that are saying, I'm not going to do any work. I'm not going to spawn. And so you notice these receiver effects have no spawner. So they have no spawn module. They're just sitting there dormant. And then down in this event handler, 
I have an event handler that's listening for that location event that's being sent by this other guy. And then in response to it, I'm telling it, hey, spawn a particle. I want you to spawn one particle every time you hear that event. And then, potentially after I spawn that particle, I want to do some work. So I spawn that particle. I have a special handler who takes in all that data that we had packed through. So I've got a little event handler that sucks in all of the data that it got from that event. And it's doing a whole bunch of work like writing that data back to the new particle's velocity. So it's inheriting some of the velocity of the parent, or it's inheriting its position, that kind of stuff. Um, and then I'm doing a little extra work to uh, jitter that to offset it from that, that position in space. This is really powerful because now I have a, a particle over here, and I can have another emitter that's listening for whatever it, it wants to say, and then it can respond to that. Um, another piece of sort of tribal info, at least as far as events are set up right now, um, events happen the next frame. So there's mm -hmm. a frame latency between the, the emitter sending an event and then a receiver actually handling that particular event. And so sometimes you might have to extrapolate based off velocity from the previous frame mm -hmm. to keep things in sync. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'll get to the last hallway, but we should, we should talk about these at the very least. Uh, this, is, this is an advanced user thing, but is super awesome, and all of us are addicted to it <laughs> now that we're used to it. Um, but this is, is an example of an effect with no modules. And the entirety of the behavior of the simulation is done with a couple of dynamic inputs and then a whole bunch of expressions. And if your eyes are glazing over right now, that is totally <laughs> fine. That is totally fine. <laughs> this is a power user thing. But if you're a programmer or if you know how to write HLSL or even if you just kind of know the simple math and you think you could learn a little bit of the syntax of how we do stuff, you can actually write little math expressions in here in line that are actually being written, the result of the evaluation of these expressions is being written to the attributes of the particle. So I have this little expression here that says, hey, give me a random number between 0 and 1.5 uh, plus some fixed amount, and that's my particle lifetime. Cool. Uh, and then what is my position supposed to be? Well, it's the position that I had plus some random value plus a random number. OK, that's kind of interesting. Um, how big do you want to be? Well, give me another random number and then add some value to, to make sure it's, it's, it's fixed. Or do really complex things, like I'm going to take the cross product of a random vector and my current velocity to make me spiral and spin. Th again, this is power user stuff, but if I'm someone who under already understands these systems, I can go in and just write this behavior natively. Right. There's a, there's a bonkers amount of power <laughs> in here. You just you have to decide how you want to work. Basically, right. this might not be something for like every game team or whatever. But if you're a real power user and want to do a, script something really complex, but if you're going to be VFX heavy, it's probably something to yeah. And and it's great to learn and, and it'll exp expand your knowledge. Um, this is the exact same idea as the other one, so I won't dwell on it too much. But this is our events uh, for collisions. Uh. So basically, I have this event generator that is spawning a particle, and then when it collides, it makes some decisions. And the collision is a line trace. And the line trace returns back the, you know, attributes of the material and the right. impact vector and how fast was I going and all the normal things you would want with collision. And then we have helper modules which will, um, you know, give you the behaviors you want. The one thing that isn't immediately clear to people is that we've actually broken this up into some chunks based on the behaviors you want because it gives us more power, more flexibility. Um, so you can see here I'm performing my collision query, but I'm actually doing anything with it. So I have a module which is doing my line trace to see, hey, am I going to hit something? But it doesn't actually do any work. I then have some additional modules that are waiting for this guy to be written and then responding to it. So linear impulse basically is a bounce. Right. And so I could say, hey, I did my query. I got my information back. Now I'm going to put down a bounce module. And then I also want my particles, if they're below a certain velocity threshold, to just stop moving. So I'm going to put in a rest behavior. And we can keep writing behaviors. That's why we did it in this modular way. Um, the other thing that's interesting is I could get my line trace, my collision trace, and then do nothing with it by default. I could use that to write to a parameter, which I put into some arbitrary other part of the sim. Right. So I do my trace to say, hey, I'm about to bounce, 
but I don't do any work, except I send that event to a whole other particle system that makes it get bigger by 10% or some <laughs> really arbitrary thing. Right. Mm -hmm. like, like building a snow pile or something. I can, right? Totally. Yeah. Like I can do, I now have a lot of control here because we've broken it up into these modular chunks. And so as you go through and you wonder, well, why isn't this just one module? Like make my particles bounce. Right. That's because we think that eventually power users are going to go like, ah, I want to get clever here. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to start writing this stuff out to them in a way that allows them to be clever. Mm -hmm. And we actually supplied that to them from day one instead of them having to write these new new modules. That's awesome. Basically. Cool. Thanks um, so much for showing us this stuff, man. It's Yeah, it's our pleasure. This, um, this we've stuff's amazing. If you want, I can breeze through the final three, or if you like, we can just call it and go I to another one. It's, a, it's up to you. As much as I would love <laughs> to continue, and I know we have a lot of folks that are just chomping at the bit <laughs> to have even more information. We do need to wrap it up. That's um, fine. There's a secret third room back here that you guys aren't allowed to know about. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Just download these examples. There's descriptions. You guys will see what they do. Um, hopefully the context we've given you from these two halls will be enough for you to kind of parse what's going on down in this one. And, then and, who, and who knows, maybe we can do another one of yeah, these. If you're, if you're open to it, we would absolutely love to have you all back. Like yeah. This is incredibly informative, and I know our community has tons of questions regarding all of this. I can't wait to see oh. the effects of this stream. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. My life, everyone. Life. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yes, it's been <laughs> incredibly helpful. Yeah, this is awesome. You know, yeah, it's our pleasure. And, you know, and go get get to the forums. We've got Discord links. We've got forum posts. We've yeah. got stuff. Like, you know, we're, we're going wide <coughs> as far as trying to connect to the community with this tool. Mm -hmm. We are desperate for feedback. Yeah. It's been like five of us in a room banging did on it. It's just not enough. If so. we haven't done it yet, we, we did this a little with material la layering to get feedback. And I don't know if we've done it with Niagara, but we could always start a forum thread where compost. Obviously, yeah, if you have mm -hmm. bugs and things like yeah. that, we really need that to go yep. into our bug submission form. But as far as like feedback and yeah, usability, we could have a centralized yep. location that Do would it. help. Um, yeah. Let, yeah. let us know the link. On. We're there. We'll, yeah. we'll spam that out later at some <laughs> point. <laughs> a couple housekeeping things. Um, as always, I've dropped a survey into our chat channels. Please let us know how you like the stream, what kind of topics you'd like to see in the future, and just generally how we're doing. Yep. If you do fill it out and include your email address, we'll include you in a raffle for an Unreal Engine t-shirt. I think this is the fourth one, right? Third or fourth. I don't know. Third, if it's the fourth so one, we'll do them monthly, yeah. um, but each week is a, a chance to win. Yep. Um, always check for local meetup groups, unrealengine.com slash pro slash unrealengine, or meetup.com slash pro slash unrealengine. Um, there are people in your area, probably, making cool stuff in Engine. If not, you can start up a group yourself, and we'd always love to hear from you about that. Uh, submit your project to the NVIDIA Edge program. You know, NVIDIA supplies us with these swanky 1080 TIs, and you have a shot at one t coming to your doorstep if you're tagging us and letting us know what you're working on. There's more info on our site for that. Uh, you want to talk about the countdown? Of course. So uh, each week we start the stream with a five-minute countdown, and each week we have... Um, a speed dev. So if you're gonna, if you're interested in having your project shown on the show, uh, put together like a 30 or 40 minute uh, video and then compress it into five minutes. Send it to community at unrealengine.com. Uh, include a PNG of your logo and just a description so we can talk about that. I think right now we're at four, and we'd love to see your project show up on the show. And I'm sure these guys would love to see some some projects with awesome. FX in there. Um, be amazing. And Amanda had mentioned uh, we're going to spin up a thread. The other thing I'd love to see is if you guys put together some amazing FX using Niagara, share that stuff on the forums because oh, we're absolutely. in there. We want to see what you guys are working on. We want to help, uh, you know, and, and if you have issues or run into problems, especially with Niagara being in an early access, we want to be able to get in front of those problems. And if there's something that we see, then we can get it over to you guys and you guys can, can help with Totally. That. And, and the other thing, too, is like the mention of, hey, the sprite rotation thing. Like you don't really have a great solution for that by default. We are missing wedges of the pie, <laughs> right. and to get users to come out and say like, "Why don't you just have a module for this?" Like, I want, I want, I would use this every day. Why, mm -hmm. why do I have to jump through hoops? We want to know that so we can write you really awesome default behaviors, right. so you can just drop it in. It just works. Um, that's our ultimate goal: is to lots of just work stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so please, 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 as part of your feedback, say what's missing, yeah. um, so that we can write it for you. Yeah. So I'll get with you all, and we can get that up and send it out. So. Cool. Uh, thank you once again for joining us. It was really valuable yeah, to have you It's our pleasure. Out. Yeah, happy and to do it. thank you all for coming, and we will see you next week. Take care, guys. Bye.